Good afternoon. My name is Greg Brick, and I'm here to tell you about Minnesota Caves history and lore. It's a huge topic, and um, I've been collecting information about Minnesota Caves for about 30 years. I've published several books and more than 200 articles on the topic. And to facilitate matters here, I'm going to um, break the topic up into several manageable chunks. First one, first chunk is prehistoric caves. And by this, I mean, well, you know, most caves are prehistoric in a sense they were here before human beings. Um, but by this, I mean caves that have uh, Native American artifacts, something like that. And um, the uh, example I have, and there are many, again, as I'm going through here today, you realize um, I'm just skimming the cream off, you know, a huge number of examples, and, and I could sit here all day showing slides of caves. Um, but um, this one uh, is the Giant Beaver Cave in Highland Park neighborhood of St. Paul. Um, a skeleton of Castor Oides Ohioensis, the giant beaver, was found there. Radiocarbon dated to 10,000 years B. See and uh, before present, and uh, it was um, thought that there was a, a sliver of, of human bone found here. Uh, turned out not to be so, but there are other caves in Minnesota where you know we have this kind of thing, and this uh, was could have been a, a very significant uh, archaeological site. And there was there were Paleo Indians around at this time, most likely anyway. Um, Proceeding chronologically to our next uh, chapter, as it were, uh, Pioneer Days. Um, the earliest mention in literature now um, of caves uh, in Minnesota uh, was by the French fur trader Pierre Charles Le Sueur as he was making his way up the Mississippi River um, in the year 1700. And when he got to Lake Pepin, which you can see out in the distance, framed by the walls of this cave, um, he said there were saltpeter caves. And saltpeter is one of the three essential components of gunpowder, so it was of great interest to him. And uh, this is what I did my PhD dissertation on. I sampled these soils, and uh, saltpeter, of course, is potassium nitrate. These soils were high in nitrate. Um, and so this is definitely one of the source materials that could be used for making saltpeter. So that was 1700, okay? But the real um, start of, or the baptismal font, as it were, of caving in Minnesota is Carver's Cave in St. Paul. Um, and here we have a photograph taken inside Carver's Cave. You see the subterranean lake, a guy in a wetsuit there. Um, this subterranean lake was described by John, the British colonial explorer Jonathan Carver in 1766, um, and it became, you know, a well-known historic spot uh, to stop for subsequent um, travelers uh, for hundreds of years. And just went past its 250th uh, anniversary. The other uh, equally famous cave in St. Paul, and indeed the cave where the city of St. Paul was supposed to have been born, was Fountain Cave. And it was called, so called, because there was a spring of water flowing out the entrance, which you can see in this image, which happens to be the earliest image of a Minnesota cave, dated to 1850. Very nice pen and watercolor um, sketch. But you can see, even at this early time, um, human beings had that inveterate tendency towards graffiti, an obnoxious, uh, you know, that obnoxious tendency to, to want to carve their name every place. Well, it's the city of, these are both for some St. Paul Carver's Cave and Fountain Cave, these two natural caves. Um, then we had a, a whole bunch of artificial caves dug in St. Paul, beginning, beginning in the 1840s uh, with the advent of the German immigration in, in waves. And they brought with them their fondness for lager beer. And this was a new 
beer in America. We were just familiar with ales, and what they found is that this this beer needs when it's in, during the fermentation step, it needs to be kept cool for an extended period of time. And so these uh, very clever uh, brewers utilize the natural refrigeration, as it were, of keeping the beer in caves underground. Um, and so what they would, would do is they would go out on the rivers and lakes in winter and bring in ice and put it in these hollowed out spaces in the St. Peter sandstone, stack it up, and it would last, you know, quite a bit of the year. Um, and they could, you know, make their lagers. Um, and here you see this is a photograph of Banholzer Cave um, in, uh, under Shepherd Road in St. Paul. Uh, they're doing a... Uh, this is not COVID related, as you might uh, think. This is actually, um, they're doing a bat count. And they're trying to prevent the bats from uh, getting white nose syndrome, the spores from their clothing. So they dress in these bunny suits. But here's another, uh, this is the largest uh, lagering cave in Minnesota. And again, artificial. Um, this is Stallman Cellars under the West 7th neighborhood of St. Paul. And you can see how cave-like these uh, places look after um, a while, after, you know, being abandoned a uh, hundred years. We move on the other side of St. Paul, the so-called West Side, and we come to a place known as Mushroom Valley. Um, and this was uh, about a one to two mile stretch. Um, where there were more than 50 mushroom caves. And these are basically, these caves were originally hollowed out for their value with silica. And silica, of course, was valuable for glass making, uh, for mortar sand in use in foundries, um, and so forth. Uh, and then when you got what, what's left, a big hole in the ground, mushroom growers um, from France found, hey, you know, this is a uh, you know, perfect set of conditions for growing mushrooms underground. Um, it's not that you can't grow mushrooms above ground, but you got to remember when you're above ground, they're competing with chlorophyll bearing organisms, whereas, you know, they can ripen underground uh, at these lower temperatures and the flesh of the mushroom becomes much more desirable for, you know, culinary purposes. Here's the largest, this is an image, 1923 image, the largest of the mushroom caves. Um, the Becker Sand and Mushroom Cave along what is now Water Street. It still exists, but the entrance is sealed. And here you see some of the old floor beds uh, with a little narrow little path there for the mushroom farmer to walk in between the ghostly blossoms of the mushrooms. Uh, and this is before the invention of, of course, of the wooden tray system where you see the trays stacked up like library, sh like bookshelves on either side. It was a later invention. Some of these caves were repurposed uh, and one of the great uses was as a uh, entertainment caves or nightclub caves and thus we find uh, this is the most famous of them, Mystic Caverns, uh, St. Paul's Underground Wonderland and this is from a 1933 newspaper advertisement uh, and this is right after um, Prohibition ended uh, so it's all above board, uh, and um, they used this old mushroom cave, and they had it put this magnificent nightclub in there. And it also happened to be the year that um, King Kong appeared in the movies, a classic version with Fay Ray, and so to celebrate that, there was a, a gorilla-themed entrance to the cave, which you see down there in the lower right. I think that's just precious. Uh, this was became a trend about a mile away. Another one started, Castle Royal, and also Mushroom Cave. This one still exists as the Wabasha Street Caves, and um, it's they give cave tours. Uh, I think they're suspended temporarily at this point, but um, they are. I highly recommend it. They have a great gangster tour and so on. Let's go over to the neighboring city of Minneapolis. Um, and look at some of their caves. I think one of the, the most fascinating one to me is certainly uh, Sheik's Cave under the downtown area. 
Uh, and you can see there's the outline, the dashed line of the, the, this cave and where it fits with the buildings and it says cave entrance. Uh, you are not to imagine that there is a cave entrance in the street. Um, that cave entrance is actually 75 feet below ground. There's a manhole entrance that goes down a 75 foot shaft to the cave. So this is you know, pretty far uh, underground. Um, but it's called Sheik's Cave because it uh, was, it's under what is now the Sheik's Night Club. It's a gentleman's club kind of thing. You get the picture. Um, uh, here's a 1939 uh, quick sketch map of Sheik's Cave uh, by a, a, a re reporter for a Minneapolis newspaper. He went on what he grandly called his camera safari into the lost world under the Minneapolis loop and found therein uh, such things. You can see here fungus gardens, um, dried up waterfalls, uh, and so forth. Very interesting. And here's some photos. Uh, on the right you can see from that exp 1939 expedition there is the daring reporter himself looking off into looking at that dried up waterfall. And there I am in the year 2000 looking right back at him in approximately the same uh, location. The largest cave uh, under Minneapolis, however, I mean, Sheik's Cave is huge. I mean, this thing goes under a, you know, a city block in the downtown area. To kind of get out of the downtown area, there's, there's one that's, that's much larger in volume, uh, and that is Channel Rock Caverns. Um, and this is, did some recent studies have uh, indicated that there is perhaps some uh, a hypogenic mechanism of formation here that this was due to upwelling uh, of water from below and carved out the St. Peter sandstone rather than uh, an epigenic mode where, you know, water is coming from the surface and flushing the grains out um, as, as, as is known to have happened with Carver's Cave and Fountain Cave, those that's ones I just showed you. Um, that same mechan that same method of mechanical washing is thought to have occurred here too to create this cave, but again from a from a hypogenic source or from below. You just, the figure that there it gives you an idea of the immense scale uh, of this cave. I mean, you could set up like you know tennis courts in there. I mean, it is it is just huge. Uh, a third uh, famous Minneapolis cave is Shoots Cave. Um, named after um, the uh, uh, Richard Shute, the director of the uh, St. Anthony Falls Water Power Company, and he was digging a mill canal, which you can see in the in the lower right hand corner. It says Shute Tunnel there, and he happened to strike this natural void. And um, and for you know some other structures were built around there. And in 1980, unfor excuse me, in 1880, unfortunately, the entire thing collapsed in a giant sinkhole. The street was, it was so undermined by a uh, source, like extraneous source of water washing it at the void and making it larger, got so large it collapsed, creating a 300 foot sinkhole. This is one of the largest in Minnesota in historic times. I'll just talk about some southern show caves. Um, and there is, as it were, a belt running across southern Minnesota that has these uh, show caves. And a show cave, of course, just to be clear, is a tourist cave. It's a cave where you, you pay to go in there and, you know, there's generally a guide who shows you around and that kind of thing. And, and you know, they're, you know, found all around the world, of course. Um, and Minnesota's, uh, you know, Minnesota has had about a dozen of these, some of them very obscure. The most, the best known and the ones still operating today um, are Mystery Cave, first one here, I'm, and this is Minnesota's largest natural cave, um, and it's, you know, in the, in the southeastern karst counties of Minnesota, uh, and, and formed by classic karst processes. Um, you know, dissolution of limestone, and it uh, this this is from an old postcard. And by the way, I you know 
some of these uh, images are from the National uh, Cave Museum uh, in Kentucky. And it's you know recently uh, formed organization, and uh, I'm just amazed this guy, a Gordon Smith, who has the largest cave postcard collection in the world, more a hundred thousand. I was just I, I just spent some happy days down there looking at you know, all these postcards. Uh, but, but here you see, you know, this gives you a sense of how touristy that, that Mystery Cave was. And, and again, of the 12 miles making up this largest cave in Minnesota, only a small fraction of those were developed as, as actual tourist passages. The cave was under private ownership for years, and then, of course, uh, was taken over by the Minnesota DNR. Has had it had it uh, managed it uh, since and reinstalled, you know, made the uh, you know refurbished the trails and everything. The second really big show cave in Minnesota is Niagara Cave, uh, which, as its name suggests, has a waterfall, a little Niagara Falls inside. This cave, it's not the longest, you know, Mister Mike Cave might be the longest cave in Minnesota. But Niagara Cave is the one with the most vertical relief, about 150 feet of vertical relief with, you know, 60-foot waterfall um, in there. And, of course, there are many postcards like this one um, of uh, the cave made over the year. And then still, again, a going concern under the Bishop family. And then there's, in, recent, in, in 1989, was established the Minnesota Cave Preserve by John Ackerman. has certainly been the, um, the most active cave explorer in Minnesota. Um, and uh, he has purchased numerous properties and, and pushed the caves, uh, you know, and exploring more passages, mapping them. Um, creating entrances to preserve them from, you know, trespassers and so on. He's, he's done a great deal of good um, for the caves in Minnesota. This is just one of his 43 caves, as I, I think it is now. Uh, this is Tyson Cave, and you can see a spring cave, and you can see from the, from the 1870s, this image. But they found scimitar cat bones in there, um, in 2008 um, related to the saber-toothed cat. And then finally I'm just going to end up here with some northern caves, caves in northern uh, Minnesota. Uh, here's an example, here's an ice cave. Um, if the, the, uh, the GSA we were going to do a field trip uh, uh, to this, uh, this cave, um, this is the Robinson's Ice Cave. Uh, in what is now Banning State Park. It is gated. Uh, you can't just walk in there. It's gated to protect the bat population, which is, uh, you know, it's an important bat population for that part of the state. Uh, and then I'll just finish up with this uh, image from the Gordon Smith postcard collection uh, showing Cave of Waves near Ilgen City on Lake Superior. So this is on the North Shore of Lake Superior. You can see the entrances of the cave. These caves were not formed by karstic um, processes, obviously. this is These are littoral caves, or as some people call them, sea caves. It just annoys me because this is fresh water. They were created by the pounding of the waves along weaknesses, rock joints, uh, and so on over a long period of time. And you can go take a kayak and kayak through them. It's a beautiful experience. And finally, this is my last slide, just end up here. Uh, the title of my talk, Minnesota Caves History and Lore, is also the title of a book of that name, uh, published in 2017. Um, I'm not here for commercial pro pro um, propositions, but if you're interested, um, you can find this book on Amazon. If you're interested in, uses a lot of the images I've, I've shown you uh, in this presentation. And um, thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, virtual presentation.